to properly research pay, um, literature and stuff. Mine's online, so I don't really know. Oh, oh yeah, no. Well, yeah, and like how to actually read them, and like how to actually. Oh, you actually spent a lot of time at they probably more. I mean, the, not everything was useful, but how did you write the papers with the stuff you wanted? No, we had to make that. Oh no, my guy. He had the first project was CV and a personal statement. Okay, yeah, yeah. The second I mean, one was uh, least, a rhetorical analysis of yeah. um, and then, and then a uh, research paper versus the popularized version of it. Like okay. The yeah, third one was a literature not, review. So and I then the fourth one, he wanted us and to and write our own popular like, article <laughs> with using know, research uh, from I our previous We didn't have to really go the A. I really hard. So. Okay, I don't know why that curriculum was so good. Who was it? Was it? She, I, uh, she had, oh, okay. What? Yeah, no, I'm asking Alyssa. Because she had a, what? I was going to ask what you had for 251. Oh, yeah. uh, no, I, I wasn't. <laughs> I wasn't here. I, oh. My teacher was uh, gone, though. She had the flu. So she was gone for, like I think, like two weeks. Didn't give us any homework. Didn't, and then tested us on the material that she didn't cover. And I was like, oh, sweet. Oh, sweet. Yeah. Thanks. Y'all, for 252, I'm... Pretty sure you're gonna have Andre, and he's really good. Oh yeah, that'll be sweet if you have Andre. Yeah, I what class I is that? <laughs> he's like really considerate mm -hmm. about oh. his students, and like if you like have any questions, is, like wait, he's really he helpful. He's like excited to answer yeah. questions. Yeah. Well, I hope that I have. Is he the Ukrainian? I don't know. I don't know if I have or uh, some like Eastern so European. I'll do all European. European. Oh, okay. That's, that's my plan now. I'm just okay. going to wait until I get it. That's the one I was yeah. wondering. Because I know there were. Because the Dan just taught my 252, like, but I know really there was a guy in South Korea. Right. Like, from Eastern <laughs> Europe. Yeah. Dude, does, um, does, does Andre use his pad when he teaches large lectures too? I think so. I'm that'd, not sure. That'd be good. Yeah. If he does, then that'd be great. Thank you for the, the treats. Uh, oh, thank yeah. you. Yeah. Appreciate it. Thank you for your hard uh, work. <laughs> Dear my wife, I cut out. But at 12.30 last night. Nice. Yeah, Wait, do you have Midco? Because yeah. mine's been going down lately. For like the last few days, it'll just go down for like a couple hours or something. Oh, yeah. No, that's I called Midco about it. I, you should do the same. So. Uh, my roommates called him a thousand times. I blame Router more often than not. Well, it was the reason that, no, the reason like, this last, it, and it seemed like it would get to the Midco server and then it would fail. Last night was the whole house, mm -hmm. but other times it's been like one room. Oh, okay. So yeah, that's yeah. it's been mainly a router because yeah. he actually got the Midco router. Well, I mean, they're just refurbished rental pieces of crap. So yeah. I so I, I actually have a real nice one, but he doesn't want to use that one. I have a nice Linksys that's like one step down from yeah. being used for it. Complex. Yeah, I mean, I have like a router and modem, but apparently I lost my power cable in the in the move. So nice. <laughs> oh, this is a while ago. Oh. Yeah, probably just needs like a DC twelve volt. Mostly. Right. I guess I just don't know where to go get that. Amazon. Amazon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you could probably get one for like five bucks. No. Yeah. Well, yeah. That's that's what we're renting the modem for every month, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> but anyone needs, needs to uh, depart uh, urgently? Like anyone has uh, uh, appointment at noon, literally? Uh, I Fish. gotta go at like twelve fifteen. Why? Oh, uh, so I class next semester. My special question is about Russell. No, I don't have. Because you had the uh, last but not least position of this uh, schedule. <coughs> Hey, folks, welcome to the camp for 7-6-6-7-6 class. <sighs> it was the hardest part. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, there are presentations, and they are most uh, practically important things of the class. So, uh, during the regular lectures, we are going over equations. During the labs, we are looking how to run right software on the right hardware, and today will be a summary of most important vital skills. Um, uh, many thanks to all authors for completing presentations. Uh, it is realizable that uh, you cannot do all subjects that we need, therefore we split, and everyone becomes more proficient in one aspect, and today is the time to refresh and learn from, from others. 
the skills that we are covering right now will be intensively used for the rest of the course, for the remaining homework, and especially for the mini research project. So every word that authors will pronounce here will be used in uh, practical research. The, everything was before was kindergarten. Uh, today is uh, through to uh, there will be project. So uh, we, with this presentation, we are summarizing the identity functional theory chapter and uh, fourth chapter with the United States with major focus on supporting the research project. So again, uh, here are the posters. So the presentations are dealing with software that allows to characterize molecules with gas, liquid, solid, interfaces, nanostructures, and reactions. So it is uh, uh, professionally, professional uh, software. The <coughs> presentations will cover starting from uh, fundamentals and going up to advanced aspects of use of the software. If you are seeing the um, Microsoft Windows for the first time, which I wonder, then you just find your name in the list here, and, uh, and uh, name and number in the list, and double click to pop it up. Uh, the time is no longer than 10 minutes per person. Um, and we're going 10 minutes this time. Um, we have less uh, populated class, and we can focus. It doesn't mean that you have to speak for 10 minutes. Make it three. Yeah, I definitely didn't set mine up for 10. Brevity is a sister of talent. <laughs> <laughs> so, one, uh, oh, yes. Um, 45 is not that we have 45 speakers, it's 4 5. So, uh, one of the volunteers decided to cover um, some uh, losses in, in the uh, amount of class particip participants. So, therefore, you can speak a little bit longer <laughs> if you like to. So, with this, uh, I would like to invite to the stage of Mr. Roberts, who will start teaching us of what is and how to use it. Alright, so I have uh, basically the fundamentals of DFT and the acid nucleus. So there, so DFT stands for density functional theory. Um, I do not claim to be an expert on this. I know the very basics, so if I am wrong, please help me. <laughs> Um, so there's a couple of theories that are behind the density functional theory. So uh, the basic, you know, how to do uh, molecular dynamic type stuff is the, uh, the Schrodinger equation, which has five different types of variables. Uh, T is um, shoot, is that kinetic? I think it's kinetic. <laughs> kinetic, and then B is potential. Sorry. Um, and so that has a 4n uh, system, which means that it's just extremely complicated to calculate for more than a couple of, you know, electrons, and then it just gets to be way too large. You can't do it. Uh, so there needs to be some approximation made in order to be able to calculate it. So the next approximation is the Born-Oppenheimer approximation. I probably slaughtered that name, but... Um, so there is no velocity, uh, and the nuclei are fixed, which means that um, it only it like counts the electrons. So it counts the velocity of electrons, the potential of electrons, and then that kind of thing. So it makes the calculations easier. Um, basically, that's the whole point of that. And then the Cohnenberg uh, cone theorem um, is basically just saying that if the uh, density of a system is known, the ground state properties of that system are known. Uh, but it doesn't really explain how to get the density at all. So there's like a pretty big gap in that whiteboard theory. So uh, the next thing was the cone sham theory that came along, which is basically the foundation of DFT. Um, and it assumes that all electrons are not interacting. So as a, um, if two electrons hit, they don't like interact with each other. They just 
keep on going on their paths. Um, and then that is corrected later in the theory. Um, I did not show the actual equation because the equation is, is uh, pretty intense. So it's not it's not worth <laughs> showing in a three minute lecture. So uh, anyway, so it, it fixes it later, um, but it removes it down to um, like, and then so that's the theory for DFT. And so DFT in total is a three N function. So it has X, Y, and Z. So it can be calculated. It's a lot easier. Um, and then um, it uses orbitals, not wave functions, because wave functions are too complicated to calculate using the whole, the whole thing. Um, and then uses a function of electron density instead of just, um, instead of the wave function, there we go. And then it shows the Schrodinger equation using the Cohen-Sham equation, which we talked about before. And this is the whole, this is the Cohen-Sham equation, um, but that's, Basically, the whole part is just to get the um, energy total from the density. So, yeah, that's DFT. And now we're moving on to VASP, uh, which is the system that we've been using for a little bit. Um, so for VASP, the VASP stands for Vienna Ab Initio Simulation Package. Um, I believe Ab Initio just stands for, like means from the beginning, but I could be wrong for that. I'm not I'm so sure. Um, so there are four files needed. This needs to be in a completely separate directory from anything else having to do with VASP. Um, you can have other like non-essential files besides these that won't affect the calculation of these. So like, you can have more in your directory, but there can only be one of each of these, or else the system is going to be really confused when you submit it in the end. So the postcard is the coordinates of the molecule, which is one of the most essential parts. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. K points, uh, you can just use a template for that. There's no point in remaking it. Um, in CAR, there's different types. It basically says what to do. So you can do geometry optimization, spin polarization, heating, and molecular dynamics. Um, I'm sure you could probably do more, but those are the main ones that we touched on. And if you're in our class, then you can just find all the templates in the bin instead of having to make them yourself. And then pot car, which is um, the, we'll, we'll, we'll touch on that a little bit. So the first thing to do is to make your postcard. Um, so if you have an out file from Gaussian, then you can uh, change it to a um, XYZ file using this Babel command here. Um, if you don't have an out, you can just make an XYZ file instead of having the out file. Um, and then for non-periodic models, you don't need to do uh, these next couple steps. But for periodic models, you need to find the size of the box, which I'll show on the next page. Um, so basically, you open JMOL. Is this the? Okay, so you open JMOL using this command, um, and then here's the ampersand at the end. Um, and then you measure the length of the molecule here. I'll just flip to the next page so you can see it. So you measure uh, from here all the way over there, so you can find the length of the box. And this basically is showing how much space is going to be in between when you repeat uh, the periodic model. So uh, you only you don't include two of these, otherwise there would be two of those atoms right next to each other. So you want it to be periodic and not uh, repeating in a weird manner. And then so you measure that full length, and then that box is uh, basically what you're going to actually be simulating. Um, and so you delete the atoms outside of the box, and then you save that as your XYZ file. And then you have to remember to write down what your length was, otherwise you're not going to know, and then your calculations are going to be weird. Um, and then, so you edit, you delete some junk after <laughs> at the end of it, so it's going to have the, the energy value from the out um, and something else. But, so you delete that, and then you add a space after the number of atoms. It just helps run the simulation. And so, yep, so this is what it's going to look like. And then you have to sort it into the postcard file, because it has to have this name, the postcard <coughs> name. Um, and then you rotate it. Uh, on the XYZ axis, that's just so it can have the rotate file, so then you can use the next command. Um, basically, so you find the size of the molecule. Um, so you take the size of the molecule from what? I see it. You, you, you feel that too. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> um, so you take the size of the molecule that you measured from the previous sign, uh, and then you subtract it from 
like the, the box you subtract that from the link that you find, um, which the out would be the output for this. And then uh, use the command for the the rotate command here, this one. And then you put the um, difference and then seven and seven, which will just create the size box that you want. Can you comment on this command? It's not okay, it's something different. Point it on the screen. What? Which command? Oh, this command right here. How, how does it spell? What do you mean? Oh. If, if I do not see well from here. Oh, it's like tank too vast. Okay. Yeah. And then uh, it has a couple other things. You can look at it on your page if you want. I'm sure you can see it. Um, and then if you're not using a periodic, you want just like your mo molecule in a box. Uh, you want the biggest box you can without overloading the system. So you just put in 10, 10, and 10, and that'll give you the perfect size box um, to calculate it. Unless you have like a larger system, then you can base it off of your system. Um, okay, now we're going to do pot car. Uh, so basically, you want to make sure that you have the molecules in the right order. So you do the um, head postcard, and it'll show uh, what, which molecules you have in what in what order. Because if it's mixed up, your calculations aren't going to work. Um, and so you put them in order using this command right here. Um, this is the thing that changes. So if you've got an oxygen, that'd be an O. Uh, pretty simple stuff. And then it goes into the pot car. Um, you do this command however many times for however many molecules you have. So, um, okay, uh, for our hydrogen you only do it once, for oxygen you only do it once, but you do it for each of them. So you don't have to do more than one, you don't have to do it more than once for that specific element. Um, and then to make sure that you have them in the right order, which is essential, you have to grep it. Um, and grep is just pulling it out, and then it'll show right there, um, well this is the head of that. Um, and then it'll show right here, this is H, O, and then that, which correlates with the top one right there. Um, and so then your stuff is in the right order. If it's not, um, then just start over, because that's the easiest way to do it. <laughs> if there's another way to do it, um, please let me know. <laughs> okay, and then you just uh, copy the K points from the bin, and then whichever in car you would like. So this one's uh, the GM one, and it copies into the in car name because um, it has to be named in car. You can do the molecular dynamics or uh, partial charge or whatever you want to do, um, but you have to make sure that you copy it into the in car file. And this is what the in car file looks like. Um, if you want geometry optimization, uh, you can change that to like 150 or something like that. Um, if you don't want geometry optimization, you just want a single point calculation, you have that as zero. And then, so basically, just all in all, VASP is um, better than Gaussian at computing at real temperatures. Um, and then uh, you can do periodic models, uh, which is super helpful if you're doing like very large systems, you don't have to deal with that. And then uh, can compute reactions, so that's also really nice. And it's not user friendly, so that's a that's a big con. Um, so if you're not good at it, it's kind of hard to get to know. But once you do, it's it's a lot better than guessing. Okay, let's thank you, Lisa. <laughs> Any questions about preferring input files for us? So everyone is confident how to do it. Okay, I'll take it for the record. Um, no, 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 I do have a question. Oh, okay. So, uh, which, uh, wh what you have presented is uh, um, very appreciated. It is a long, complicated procedure. Yeah. And in long procedures, uh, humans often do errors, all of us. So, which errors did you experience? And, like, uh, if you do something wrong, uh, what are the consequences? Like, if uh, maybe putting wrong uh, adjustment of the cell size or something else or swapping order of atoms? Um, I didn't swap the order of the atoms ever. I didn't try it uh, because I knew not to because it was very clear to me. Uh, but one thing that I did mess up on is I made all of my atoms periodic models because um, I didn't realize that you could just have your atom in a, in a box and not have it be periodic in VASP. So it doesn't have to be periodic. You can have a regular like atom with hydrogens and like that kind of thing in there. I didn't realize that, <laughs> so that was a mistake. Okay, so you discovered that one of us also can do isolated mode. Yes, yeah, and okay. I didn't know that. I thought it was only periodic. Okay, let's thank Alisa once again. <laughs> Please do not hesitate to ask questions. It's your chance, you're helping each other. And next presenter is Christian Gims. 
uh, he will do the best subject in the visual recognition of scientific information. But uh, in Rust, as Alisa has mentioned, it is a little more challenging than in, in other pieces of software. So uh, uh, he will tell what are orbitals, how to compute them, and how to interpret them. Thank you, Dimitri, for the intro. As I said, I'll be discussing how to create orbitals through Beyond by using BASP. So before we can start creating our orbitals, we have to um, successfully actually run a DOS calculation. Um, if you don't successfully run this, you end up not actually populating your wave car, and your wave car has to be a non-zero number. But as we all um, remember, is that if we even attempt to open our wave car by just like saying more wave car, we end up it's making our terminal weird and we start adding random symbols. So the only way to know that the wave car is non-zero is if we successfully are able to create a DOS calculation on the graph. What's a DOS calculation? Uh, density of states, um, you run, that's what it stands for, and then you get on the calculation, I mean, is by creating the, all the energies for those. Doesn't it do that for any calculation? Not, don't remember right now. I was, I was very unsuccessful actually getting this work last night. There was a, I kept on getting some random error, and that's why the rest of this will not be actually my work. So. Um, once <laughs> it was a long night. <laughs> Creative, uh, so if you somehow do successfully run, you know, your VAS and you're able to create your DOS uh, graph and everything, um, you will end up then next going and opening up your in car by um, typing in VI in car. And there's two things we need to do to this file. First, we need to delete all of these right here. I'm not entirely sure, but that's what I realized one of the things. And then the other thing is we need to change this number to how many bands we actually have in our molecule. To actually do this, we um, the, the determine how many bands we have, we just say grep MBA outcar. Um, MBA is not National Basketball Association. Um, and um, NBA stands for number of bands, and then we get this right here, and mine was 160, uh, in this case it was 168. So that's where we go and replace that 1280 with the 168. That is how many orbitals we could possibly have. Okay, no more clicker. <laughs> um, so it just going back, I deleted those and I started changing the M bands to what we determined. Um, the next thing we need to do is we need to determine the energy interval. Um, you could feasibly do all the energy levels here, but if you do that, you end up with many, 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 many orbitals. So the smart thing to do is just select a couple of numbers in your HOMO, and then like, so say negative 3.4 is right here in your ho uh, HOMO, and then you go a little past the point, and then you select say 2.5, 2.4, and that'll be your LUMO, and then that'll set your interval for uh, calculating your orbitals. So this is where you would go. This is your uh, energy intervals, and then you just type in your interval right there. Um, when you first go in, this is the number that's already there. So after all that, you go run BASP um, once you successfully change everything, and then you should end up getting your comp car, which is the molecule itself, and then we get a par charge, which is the orbitals. You will have, a, uh, depending on your uh, energy interval, you end up getting many uh, par charges, depending on how many there is to calculate. So what you would do next is, with these uh, files that I pointed out, is you would load them through the, um, this window right here by so, um, selecting new molecule, and then you go... This window of each software. Uh, VMD, sorry. This is a VMD. So once you, you so you go file or a new molecule, this will pop up. You go browse your files and you select your comp car first, and then you have to change your file type. So for the comp car, we do fast post car, and then for par charge, we um, we do fast par charge. So then those will pop up right here in this window. Now when you first um, initially put them in you won't actually see any molecule pop up or the orbitals. So what you're going to have to do next um, is then you're going to have to go 
uh, graphics representation, and then this window will pop up. Now, depending on which one you, you pull up, so in this case, this is the par charge window, um, you will then have to select, instead of points for the uh, orbitals, um, I was using solid surface, and then, uh, then you adjust the ISO value to, um, to act, um, show the orbital itself. So then here is just uh, the CPK uh, version of it. And this is a different color that got off a little bit. So right here, we can select uh, either a CPK, which will uh, give us like the small, uh, the nucleuses basically of them. And then we do, um, we can also do dynamic bonds at the same time. And you adjust the distance cutoff because um, when you just select the dynamic bonds by itself, you won't initially see the bonds. So you have to select how far away from the nucleus is um, you would pop up the uh, bonds. So you would just mess with this distance cutoff until you get the bonds you want. So this is before the additional orbitals. This is once I um, mess with the cone car and added the CPK and the dynamic bonds. And this is how the molecule looks in BMD. Um, so the orbitals for the next few parts is this is the file, and this happens to be the lowest, so it'd be my homo um, uh, orbitals. So this is if I um, mess with the spin plus down. So when you first initially put the par charge in, you have four choices to select between spin plus down, spin minus down, and then you have a spin up and then spin down. Depending on how you select, your orbitals can change. Um, the majority didn't really change in how they look, but the ISO value um, at which they showed up did change. So this is just the spin minus down. As I said, they look the same, but the ISO value had, did change. The orbital down, though, actually did change, and this is the only one I saw when I did that. And then back to, they basically look the same. Also, if you really want to, you can add multiple par charges and show them all at once. And this is what happens when I added two different orbitals at the same time. Then, um, the, in this, we have the orbitals and their energies. So this is uh, how the occupied, and these are unoccupied, and then this is our density states for the two of them. So. Okay, let's thank uh, Christian and his uh, favorite character. <laughs> that was me last night. <laughs> so, uh, questions to Christian. Please. Is bands like synonymous to orbitals then? Yes. Um, so, for some reason, BASP, instead of using orbitals as the name, they say bands. More questions. There is something is uh, missed and we need to, to cover together, uh, not to show weakness of the, of the talk, but to progress together as a, as, a, as a group. So, spin up and spin down. When do they, when are they relevant? And anyone wants to participate, please uh, raise hands or just uh, start uh, like shooting. In metals or if you have like a... Open shell Good. Theory. It's oh. it's scientific, scientific point of view. But uh, if we are just um, launcher of the launchers of the software, which tag controls presence or absence of spin? Apple, <laughs> Apple products. Huh? Oh, what? I spin. Yes. Oh. So by default, uh, it computes closed shell. Okay. Is I spin equal one? Okay. Right? Yeah. What should be the value if you want to allow two components of spin? I spin equals? Uh, what are you? Yes! <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> okay, let's thank Christian once again. <laughs> and please keep, uh, you want to ask Christian? Well, I have a question on just that topic. Uh, we will keep asking each other on this question because we need to learn more about it. And we cannot avoid it, it's an important part of the class. Go ahead. So, if you have ice cream. And uh, let's invite next presenter where we discuss. Vijay Shak will talk about the key points.
So, okay, so if you have i spin equals to one in the calculation, then you load your your power charge files. If you use i spin one, it means you uh, request system to be a singular. True, but will it still give you these other options in the? They are the, nominal the, and they do not change anything. So they wouldn't. They, they are there, applicable. They wouldn't. The uh, full answer by Christian should be uh, spin up, spin down, and their subtraction is applicable only for i spin equals two, which he answered in a brief way. I spin equals two. So next presenter is Vijay Shah. Uh, he will present subject that we didn't cover in labs. So you, uh, some of you will hear it for the first time. The periodic materials do have solutions of electronic states that do not sit with zero average velocity, but progress forward. And uh, solutions progressing in different directions with different velocities do coexist. Vijay will tell how to take into uh, account this property of uh, electronic structure solutions. All right, thank you for the introduction. Um, so yeah, this is uh, this presentation is dealing again with BASP, uh, as is or as are all of the presentations. But uh, we're working with the K points file in particular um, and the concept of effective mass. So uh, just a brief review for periodic structures. Um, here's a picture from or from Wikipedia on periodic potentials. Um, so you can basically see that for each um, for each factor of a that you go along. Uh, the horizontal axis, your, uh, your potential is periodic, meaning that it just repeats itself over and over again. Um, and uh, this means that if you're um, going a distance a away from where you're starting um, in your solid, then your orbitals will just have an extra phase factor included in them. Um, and then next, the concept of effective mass, it basically just describes deviations um, from the mass of the electrons in your solid, from the mass of free electrons. So this is given uh, by this handy equation right here. I'm going to go more in detail with this equation later. Um, I'll also reproduce this equation when I go into more detail. So don't feel like you have to remember it right now. So uh, the k-points file uh, lists the different points that populate um, uh, what's called the Brillouin zone in uh, reciprocal space or momentum space. And there's two different ways to actually create this file in BASP. The first one being uh, to, um, to specify the coordinates directly in your k-points file. Um, so this slide is dealing with this first method uh, with, um, with specifying these coordinates. And um, in this example file right here, you see um, that the second line tells you how many k points that you want to run your calculation for. So you can have one, you can have four, you can have uh, 2,000 if you wish. Um, I wouldn't recommend 2,000. So um, then this third line right here, you can either specify Cartesian or um, I believe reciprocal. I can't remember the exact tag for specifying reciprocal, but um, when you specify Cartesian coordinates, you just have to specify the x, y, z coordinates um, as well as uh, different weights. And then um, using these x, y, and z coordinates, you can actually calculate the, uh, the coordinates in reciprocal space uh, just by this formula right here where a is the lattice constant of your, uh, of your solid. So um, the second way to actually generate your k-points file, this is what we were working <laughs> with in uh, lab, we were just doing automatic uh, mesh generation based on information supplied uh, to BASP itself. So here you just specify uh, automatic mesh. That's just a header, so you can basically write whatever you want there. But automatic mesh is um, it's a tag basically to let you know that okay, this is my k points file for automatic mesh generation of the k points. Um, for the second line, you have to specify zero, though, and that's what actually tells BASP that uh, you're supplying the number of subdivisions um, for your Brillouin zone, um, and you want BASP to actually compute the points uh, by itself. So um, in our simulation, uh, this first letter, capital M, is what we specified. Uh, so that's what BASP reads in, and then um, these three numbers right here in line four specify the number of k points in each dimension that you want. So you can change um, all of these. This is the sample fire from the 
uh, titanium dioxide oligomer genes that we use. Um, so I was kind of playing around a little bit with that, just uh, changing the number of K points in the X direction because that's the direction that our solid was periodic in. And then finally, uh, this fifth line just specifies uh, the shift of your mesh. So either up, down, left, right, um, or basically in and out of your computer screen. Um, so all three dimensions. And an important thing to note is that if you have just molecules, uh, you don't actually need um, just uh, K points. Whereas for semiconductors and insulators, uh, you will need K points. And for metals, you'll need approximately 10 times as many K points as you would for both semiconductors and insulators. So uh, after you run your simulation in VASP, uh, you'll see um, all of these different um, columns in VASP, or excuse me, in your outcar file. And uh, this will be pretty close to the beginning of the outcar file. You'll actually see the different, um, the different coordinates for your K points. And once you uh, scroll further down to where you would usually uh, take your energy states in order to compute density of states, uh, you'll see um, not just one set of energies and one set of um, one set of numbers specifying how many electrons are in each state, but you'll actually see um, as many sets as uh, for the number of k points you have. So, for example, um, two slides back, I specified five k points in the x direction, um, but because our model was symmetric, it actually only used three k points. Um, so symmetry is something that's also very important here. It can actually reduce your computation time greatly um, if your model is symmetric, uh, whereas if it is not, then it would have used all five k points. Um, and then the simulation itself would have taken a little bit longer. Um, when you get to solids, that's when it's even more important because you don't want to be computing 2,000 k points when you could only be computing 1,000, for example. So um, here you can see, or I guess you can't right now, but on the slides on the <laughs> sheet, you can see that there's three different sets of uh, homo and lumo states. And um, if you actually um, run a couple of different commands, which I'll outline more on the next slide, um, you can generate this nice plot right here um, showing the, uh, the homo and the lumo states as a function of um, the, uh, the momentum coordinate for your k points. So um, basically what you have to do is you have to parse the outcar file, um, extract a couple of different uh, a, a couple of different col or a couple of different rows from your outcar file specifying the homo and the lumo energies and which states those are present in. Um, and then you have to combine all of that into one file. And uh, there's a new plot script in the bin folder that you can use to actually generate uh, this plot just using the set of commands on the slide. Um, and then similarly, you can also plot uh, just the LUMO energy as a function of uh, your K points momentum. So instead of, um, instead of new prog underscore band almost go, or underscore holu, you just do new pro underscore band. And that will give you this first plot right here, which is basically just taking the LUMO energies from the second plot, which was also on the previous slide, and zooming in on it. So I also did this for the perovskite nanowire. So um, I played around with the number of K points that, um, that VASP used in order to generate results. And um, first off, here's specifying that I wanted um, 11 subdivisions in the uh, Z direction. But by symmetry, again, there were only six K points actually used, um, one being at the origin and then five being in the positive Z direction. So uh, you can see that it's kind of choppy here with um, all of the plots that we have, um, especially when you zoom in to the LUMO energy as a function of momentum. Um, and however, when you use 25 K points in your calculation, um, you can see that it's a lot, all of these curves are a lot smoother. Another thing to note for 25 K points is that um, you're, your LUMO energy actually starts to level off. However, with six K points, it's still rising right here. So you can already see uh, a big improvement when you increase the number of K points, especially at lower values. 
Um, and when I specify 50k points, then uh, there's not too much of an improvement that you can see just by comparing the two graphs by themselves. But um, there we go. OK, well, um, when I actually like submitted this presentation, it was rotated right side up. So I'm not sure what happened here. <laughs> but uh, this graph is just basically something I generated by myself in order to show the comparison between 6k points, 25k points, and 50k points. Um, so uh, I apologize that's not really easy to kind of parse right now, but there wasn't a huge difference in the overall shape between 6 and 25k points. Um, but you can see that the solid line right here differs quite a bit from both of these dashed lines. The solid line's for 50k points. Both of the dashed lines are 6 and 25k points. Um, so overall, you can see that there's kind of like a shift um, upwards in the, uh, in the LUMO energy as a function of your momentum uh, when we increase from 25 to 50k points. Um, here we go. I guess this is basically reproducing this plot, but also with a couple of trend lines. So here's where we're getting to effective mass. Um, so if you're analyzing your HOMO energies as a function of the momentum from your k points, then you can actually extract the effective mass of your holes in your solid, whereas if you're um, if you're analyzing lumeral energies, that's where you're finding the effective mass of your electrons. And in order to actually determine this effective mass, um, what I did is um, I plotted the homo energies as a function of um, of the dimensionless momentum, basically your k points um, your k points coordinate, and um, I took the limit where the dimensionless momentum was closer to zero. So I didn't use every single point that I computed, but only like the only like half of the points. Um, I didn't go too close to zero, so I still went out to about 0 0.3. But um, if you fit a quadratic equation to these um, to these data sets, then uh, you'll see that for um, so this top equation right here is for 50k points, 25k points, and then 6k points. So you can see a big difference in this first coefficient right here. But if you multiply that coefficient by 2, take the reciprocal of that number and multiply by h bar squared, basically signifying um, that you're taking the second derivative with respect to k of your homo energies, uh, then you can determine the ratio of effective mass to the mass of your electron, or the mass of a free electron. And then similarly for your LUMO energies. Um, so I determined the ratio for these as well, just using the same method. So in summary, K points is very important if you want to actually model your materials accurately. Um, symmetry plays a huge part, uh, a huge role in actually speeding up your computation time. And uh, once you run your vast simulations, you can determine the effective mass of holes and electrons by plotting uh, homo and lumo energies as a function of your actual k-point coordinates. Uh, so with that, then thank you for listening. Thank you for speaking. <laughs> it's a really, really important uh, presentation <clears throat> that opens uh, wings for those of us who need to simulate nanowires or uh, periodic bulk structure. Questions to Vijay? Yes? Why do we care about effective mass? Um, so effective mass is basically um, something that appears in solids. So it's basically saying that like the mass of your electron in solids might not actually be the same of ma uh, the mass of a free electron. Um, so that's something that arises from a quantum mechanical point of view. So um, because there's the, there are those deviations from the mass of a free electron, um, that's something that's actually important to describe um, like where the electrons could be um, located, like basically the orbitals. But let me um, add comment. Steep or shallow is this dispersion curve. It's determined by the value of effective mass. What, is, what was it telling you? Effective mass is a measure of inertia, response of kinetic energy to change of momentum. In your kinetic energy, p square over 2m, if mass is different, the response will be different. Alisa, you wanted to ask something? Oh, well, I just don't know what a k point is. 
Oh, it's yeah. a random question. Well, yeah, so um, I guess I didn't really include a figure to um, make it really clear, but basically when you go from real space where you're specifying like your spatial coordinates, so for example, X, Y, and Z, to reciprocal space where you're using momentum coordinates, so for example, um, X momentum, Y momentum, and Z momentum. Can you scroll back to your um, second yeah. slide? Um, oh, this will, oh, yeah, this will be easier. <laughs> Yeah. So, um, so basically, right here you would have. No, no, no. no just show equation. The lowest equation. Oh, right here. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. So k points is basically determining this k vector right here. Um, so it's basically determining um, when you're going to from. It's basically like the momentum of your electrons at a point in your solid. Okay. Yeah. So if uh, let me add. Uh, you saw the exponential that Vijay was pointing on. Mm -hmm. If the wave function has such a factor, it means the wave function moves forward. And the stuff that is multiplied by r determines the velocity, momentum, or in this colloquial language, k point. So how quick the solution moves across. Make sense? Yes, that makes sense. More questions to Vijay? Suppose your uh, dispersion curve is flat. Would it mean that the uh, effective mass is zero or infinite? Um, in that case, it would mean that your effective mass is infinite because it's you're, good. yeah. It's correct. Then thank you very much again. <laughs> and the next presentation is by Bradley. Uh, his presentation number 45 is not because we have 45 speakers, but because, because he covers subject number four and subject number five. Um, the each section is critically important for our success, but the one is, uh, which Brian is going to present is uh, fundamentally critically important. So uh, what he is uh, going to present is a way how we uh, translate Gaussian numbers about charge and multiplicity into user non-friendly VASP uh, language. So if you do not know uh, how to set up charge and multiplicity, you cannot uh, deal with real systems. And Braden will uh, address the subject with a little bit extra. What are the consequences of changing charge and multiplicity of the model? <clears throat> so, uh, as he introduced, I'll be giving a talk on so charge systems uh, and spin polarization mainly, and then a little bit at the end of uh, doing some sort of quasi excited state optimizations. <clears throat> uh, so, first, let's touch on the maybe easier one, uh, just purely charge systems. Uh, so, the the in-car tag for this is uh, n elect, which specifies literally the number of electrons. <clears throat> Uh, for that system there. Um, and so the default uh, is just a, a neutral system. So if you don't specify it at all, uh, it's just uh, you get the number of electrons equal to the number of protons. Um, so when examining maybe a new system where you don't know, if you don't know some basic chemistry, you know if it's going to be charged a system or not, um, you just kind of find the uh, neutral electron count, so uh, optimize uh, without the intellect in hand. Um, and then once that optimization has run, uh, you can just find what uh, what VASP calculated, uh, repping the intellect from the out car. Uh, so for this system, it was uh, 208. Uh, and so then from there, you can run uh, in new directories, hopefully, uh, you can run more optimizations, uh, changing this intellect in the in car uh, to plus or minus you know, a couple from the recovered and elect from out car of the initial um, and So one thing you can do is just, I guess you can't see it, but you can compare the total energies for each one of those and see if you can find something cool there. Or you can compare the DOS. Um, so I guess most of us probably know how to do this part already, but uh, I put the whole uh, procedure for creating a DOS uh, for just a, a regular material. Um, and so you need your number of electrons, Fermi level, um, this alpha beta, uh, 
the number of ions, uh, and you just call this script uh, and answer a multitude of questions. Um, so I won't go through it all. But you can choose uh, your energies uh, to be whatever you want. Uh, so here is what a neutral uh, density of states uh, would look like. So you have a uh, homo-lumo gap right here. Uh, so all of the occupied orbitals are filled, and all of the unoccupied or, or non-filled uh, are separated right down to each homo-lumo gap. Um, and I've shown some equations up there for this. It's just, essentially, it's just the number of states per interchangeable state of energy. Uh, more, maybe more accurately, the difference in the microcanonical partition function with respect to the change in energy. But you can look at the cation gas, so if you remove an electron, you have a positively charged system. Um, so you, you lose some of the, so your HOMO decreases, um, so you have part of these orbitals not being filled, uh, and opposite the So now we go to a little bit more complicated subject of spin multiplicity polarization. Uh, so for the previous uh, runs, I have just shown uh, I spin equal to one, or maybe it was commented out uh, for a non-polarized spin uh, swept order metals uh, and uh, maybe force excited states. Uh, you can choose I spin to be two, uh, which allows for spin up and spin down separate calculations. So it's more general, but it increases the computation cost. Um, so like I said, it's wise to choose two for any metal containing complexes, especially when you don't know uh, what to expect of <coughs> that. Um, so there's another one, instead of I spin, now you have this other tag called N up down. And so it's defined to be the difference between the number of up electrons and the number of down electrons. So as we know, Basic quantum mechanics, you have you know, one half and minus one half for the two spin states uh, if you assume there's something in between. Um, and so the total, uh, the total spin would be the sum of all those. Um, so if you have a complete closed shell, so your homo is composed of an up and down in that state and nothing above that, um, you have n up down being zero. The total spin is zero because they all cancel each other out. Uh, and then we say that the multiplicity is one. So multiplicity is now we are putting on here with this question by 2s plus 1. Um, and then, so you can specify n up down to be 1. So for an odd electron count, say so your homo is composed of 1 electron um, instead of 2, you will have a doublet system. Um, and so you have a spin 1 half, which corresponds to 2s plus 1. And then you can also go uh, 2. Uh, so here you get into triplet states, so you can have um, dioxygen. You start doing uh, metals and just going on with this. So there you go. Okay, so here is the oxygen or hydrogen to molecule. So we have a, a, a paired homo. So the multiplicity, the n up down will be zero, spin will be zero, and multiplicity will be one. Um, that's, so that's called a singlet ground state. Um, but if you move to a little bit cooler one, you have uh, oxygen. Um, and so you have Two unpaired ones, but uh, on degenerate levels, uh, you can call that a triplet ground state because the n up down can be two. So even for simple molecules like oxygen, you can still have some interesting multiplicity. <coughs> but um, maybe more commonly and more interestingly, we have uh, metal complexes. Um, so so for this iron complex, we have this uh, <coughs> T2G state uh, with with the all filled. But this one also would be n up down equal to zero. Um, but if you specify it, you know, you're forcing it into this low spin complex. So um, most probably it's in the low spin complex. But of course, that room temperature, depending on this uh, gap, we may not always be here. Um, so for other complexes, uh, we might encounter some high spin. Uh, so we have a couple in the increased energy orbitals. Uh, again, corresponding to this, this gap difference in electron electron repulsion. Um, but we can set it to now, and of course all of these are i spin equal to two terminations. Um, but now we can set the i spin equal to four because there are four uh, spin up electrons for this calculation. Um, and that's 
same as two. So when high spin, low spin configuration is unknown, you pretty much always want to do this, even if you have a pretty good idea. Um, so you optimize it uh, with either this commented out or n equals equals negative one, and also for n up down equals zero, one, two, three, uh, however many you deem fit. Uh, and then compare the energies uh, for these systems, and uh, the lowest energy will be probably uh, the most probable electronic configuration for the ground state of that, that complex or the material that you're <coughs> looking at. Um, so now that we've uh, been able to do calculations with uh, uh, spin, uh, two spin components, uh, we can make some cool looking density states figures uh, to see if there's a difference between uh, the spin up and spin down um, orbital energies <coughs> and uh, density. So here's again the really kind of a boring procedure, but it's nice to have kind of in one spot. <laughs> so again, you need the same stuff as before, um, and you need now this dress dos underscore up and this dress dos underscore down, and you need to answer all of these questions uh, twice. Um, again, you should probably keep the uh, line width and the energy uh, values the same. It twice with uh, that, and then you use a different uh, GB plot uh, trip. And you get this pretty graph here. Uh, so we have uh, the spin up here and the spin down, and you see that uh, they, they actually look very consistent mostly with each other. Uh, but here we have some occupied uh, sphere where we don't have any down. So, yeah, in, in general, they may not be. That it may not look different. So, which multiplicity corresponds to this uh, which we are by making? Well, looks like there's a, maybe maybe one electron that could be yeah. that could be a doublet yes. system. <laughs> so here, um, just kind of background in case you're interested, I won't go over it. But uh, if you need to manually count your electrons in your, in your system, here are two methods for for doing so. You can all take inorganic chemistry, you'll also have to know this. So it's just a fun slide. It'll help uh, choose your analytes. So you can use that. Um, okay. So uh, now we can talk about creating an absorption spectrum. So an absorption spectrum is shining light on your material and seeing where your material likes to absorb that light. Um, so you don't have to run any additional calculations uh, for the elementary methodology to create absorption spectrums um, in fact. So you can just take what you would have had for your state file for the DOS, and now you just copy the energy pop, you can see, uh, and then create an energy over or input overlap, excuse me, that just looks like this, uh, just the input of the this trip, uh, the number of orbitals, and you just follow this procedure again. Uh, the minimum and maximum energy again, uh, kind of trial and error system, line with again. <coughs> uh, then you just use this uh, new plot to strip again. Uh, pretty simple. Okay. Um, so then here we uh, have an absorption spectrum. Um, so corresponding from any any state to any, any other state, and <coughs> the valence of the conduction and what have you. Note that the lowest energy transition is most likely to be almost two most. So now we can go into a little bit more <laughs> interesting subject in the, in the quasi excited state optimization calculation. Uh, so you kind of force some electrons into the, the excited state positions of the energy or the orbital. <clears throat> and uh, run an optimization on that. So it's calculated uh, with uh, like two electrons, a couple electrons in a higher energy orbital, which will probably cause a geomet uh, geometry shift as well, uh, and also a DOS and uh, any other uh, observable properties. Uh, so creating this is uh, kind of interesting. Uh, so you, you choose uh, this I, I smear to be negative two. Uh, and then you add this extra keyword to this calculation, um, and uh, you create these numbers uh, by choosing by choosing the, 
the number of your FOMO or your ground state calculation uh, minus one for your A value, which happens to be 103 for this system, uh, multiplied by one, uh, and then put a zero, a space zero, and then add uh, the total number of orbitals from your ground state uh, minus what was the LUMO for your ground state. And that will give you the correct input for, uh, for this line. <coughs> Here's just an example to kind of see what I mean. So what happens is you have essentially an unfilled orbital followed by a fully filled orbital. So this is the highest energy state uh, optimization for the sum of electrons. And then you perform a geometry optimization. And then uh, making DOS and the absorption spectra for this are exactly the same as you would for the regular ground state optimization without the spin folder there. Uh, so here, uh, I'm to take DOS. See, there's unfilled and filled energy spectrum. Uh, so you can compare this to the ground state, which I should have done, but probably but didn't do. Which would be interesting. Um, uh, you can also create this uh, excited state absorption spectra. And I have to say, this is probably the most confusing uh, part of this process because I don't fully understand what this means physically. Um, shining light on something that's already in an excited state. But you can see lower energy transitions corresponding to you know, nearest transitions from that excited state, from the excited state level down there, closer as well as the unfilled one in the excited state. Um, so yeah, so that's how to do that. Thanks. Okay, good thing, Brendan. <laughs> Any questions? So, uh, how do you interpret this infrared? Probability to create second excited state? I guess, yeah. Okay. So the already excited state is the gap in your other one. That has other Which system is this? Because uh, we will, even if you did it in the lab, you will forget if someone will watch this uh, video 10 years later. Which system, uh, spectra for which system are used as illustration? Uh, I think this was the, uh, the lead. The lead complex. Complex or nanowire? Okay, so it's periodic in one dimension. Okay. Which question would you like to ask yourself? <laughs> okay, good. Okay, let, let, let's bring it. So, uh, next presenter is London Johnson, who will be quicker. <laughs> And he will summarize interaction <laughs> of light and matter in very energetic words. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So yeah, I'm going to be uh, talking about how to calculate and plot the absorption spectra of whatever system it is that you're trying to model. Um, so I guess the first thing that we should talk about is the actual interaction. Um, so essentially what we're talking about is if you shine light on some material, what you're going to do is take an electron from some occupied band and you're going to kick it up into some unoccupied band. Um, so in order to do that, the photon that shines on the material has to have as much energy as that um, gap between your valence and conduction or occupied and unoccupied band. Um, <clears throat> so I guess in order to actually calculate that, we need to talk about electric dipoles, and those are defined like this, where you have a vector going from negative to positive charge. Um, so this is how those are defined. Um, you can't really see it on here, but up in the top left on your sheets, you have the, the dipole moment of a molecule instead of just two point charges. So what you do is you just sum up all of these and where they're at, and then subtract wherever all of these are at. And assuming that they all have the uh, um, well, I guess there should be a factor, oops, there should be a prefactor in front of the, uh, the ions, I guess, of whatever those, whatever their charge is, instead of just the standard E. Okay, um, Z sub I. Yeah, yeah. Um, so then, the, the oscillator strength of some particular transition essentially tells you the likelihood of shining the appropriate light to actually make the electron jump to the next band, the, the oscillator strength tells you how likely the electron is to actually jump up to that next band in that situation. Um, so the way that you figure that out is uh, you, it's just some constant times the, the uh, dipole or the transition dipole moment squared. 
and that transition dipole moment is given by your initial state. Um, oh, I'm trying to say this. I can't remember what. Uh, you want to say ma matrix that. only. What's that? You want to say matrix only. Yeah, that, that would make sense. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Um, but yeah, you just do the, uh, you, oh yeah, the inner product, that's what I'm thinking of. Um, <laughs> between the initial state and final state with your dipole moment as your operator. Um, so, since this is a radial thing, you can essentially break it up into your x component squared, your y component squared, and your z component squared. Um, <clears throat> and some teamwork went into this slide, so I'm trying to... Uh, Interpret a little bit of this as I go, I guess. Um, oh, I'm just going to keep going for now, I guess. <laughs> so, okay, so to actually calculate this stuff and plot it in VASP, um, you're going to have to run VASP. So before you do it, just make sure that you have L wave equals true. I can't remember why I started looking at that, but if you don't specify this, then it'll give you an error, and if you tell it that L wave is false, you won't get any of the output files that you're going to need. <coughs> um, so after you've run VASP and you have your outcar file, uh, you're going to need to make a energy pop file for the script that we're gonna run later. Um, so the way that you can do that is just take the last 350, it depends on whatever molecule you're using, um, but you wanna take the last, like, say 350 lines from your outcar file and dump them into your energy pop file. Um, so that will look something like this from the top. Um, we just want the energy states inside of this. We don't want any headers or anything. So you want to delete all of this. So if you're using VI, which is on pretty much anything that runs Linux ever, um, you can just use the DD command to just delete line by line. Um, and then at the end of the file, you're just going to have however many lines left over. So instead of typing delete, delete, um, or DD like 192 times, you can just type 500 DD and it'll delete the next 500 lines or however many there are. Um, so that is how you create the energy population file. Um, so another file that we're going to need is the input overlap file. Um, <clears throat> And the only things that that file is going to need is the initial, or your first band and your last band, or the indexes of them. So if we have 128 bands, you just have one and then 128. Um, so I guess if you forgot however many energy bands you had, you can just use the word count function to figure it out. Uh, this one will tell you how many lines that file had. And since they're broken down row by row, then that's how many energy states you're gonna have. Um, so then to create the new file, you can just do vi and then the name of the file that you want to create. Um, press i to actually be able to edit your file and then just type in it like you normally would. And when you're done doing your edits, you just hit escape to return to command mode. And then you want to type in colon, write, quit. Um, and that should save your file and then quit. So uh, let's see. So now we need to create the file that actually has our oscillator strength information. Um, so the way that we do that is we run this file from the uh, from the binary folder. Um, you don't need to have any like file at the end of this or anything like that. You just run the file, and as long as you have your energy pop and your input overlap files, it's going to look to those, and it'll create your oscillator strength file accordingly. Um, so you should see this stuff if it runs successfully. Otherwise, it, you might get some errors if you grab like the wrong one, like I did. Um, so when that's done, you should have an OS strength file. And if you look inside of this, uh, the way that you can interpret it is this is your initial energy, um, not energy, uh, your initial orbital that the electron is in. This is the orbital that it transfers to. This is the oscillator strength or likelihood of that transition taking place. And uh, this is the energy of that transition. And then this is the, the number of electrons in this band, the number of electrons in this band. And then these are uh, projections of your transition dipole moment. Um, and there's that equation again. <laughs> <laughs> Probably the letter D stands for Greek delta. Oh, that would, uh, OK. <laughs> Um, 
Okay, so now that we have the oscillator strengths, we're going to need to make the spectrum file to actually, uh, we're going to run another bin file, and then we're going to use that to create our plot. Um, but to, uh, to make that spectrum file, I guess we need to run another one of these things. Um, so you want to run this file here. Um, it's going to ask you how many transitions you have. So to do that, you can just do the word count on your oscillator strength file. And so we had 2,415 um, different transitions that we could do. So you just want to enter that one. These will just determine the domain of the, of the plot that you're going to make. Um, these are, uh, is the line width, I guess. It, it kind of determines how discrete your plot is going to be. And then the... Uh, Inside of your energy population file, you're going to want to look at what uh, what your homo band is. Um, and <clears throat> so, I guess when you're done running this, it should succeed, and then you should now have an s.p and a spectrum file. And from those, you can create your plot. <laughs> One more time. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, okay, I guess you can at least. Okay, so it's G and U plot, um, and then you want to use this bin file to actually create your plot. So that should create spe.ps. So we just need to convert that to a PDF using ps to PDF. And then when you're done with that, you should now have your PDF file. Um, and then in order to like download that and look at it on whatever PDF viewer you're looking at, we log into our favorite computer cluster, and uh, you just pull out the file using S uh, SFTP or S. SCP, whichever one you prefer, and then this is how you can do it on the command line for my computer. And if you remember, I did 0.3 to 3, so it just kind of cuts off right here. So I should have probably put mine all the way out to 10, but I was just trying to run through this and make it work. Okay, that's been fun. Someone may ask you yeah. questions about equations. <laughs> <laughs> or should you call yourself a path maker? <laughs> Any questions to London? Let me summarize what he was doing. We are doing, for if, if we are interpreting our activity from an experimental point of view, we are completing learning our instruments. And as soon as we're done, we will start characterizing materials and developing intuitive in, uh, interpretation and understanding of materials. So it is yet our next stage. But uh, how do you interpret this peak at 0.5 Elton Uh That means that your material that you're modeling is very likely to absorb light at this energy right here. But based on the presentation of uh, your predecessor, of uh, Brain, like is it neutral, anion, cation, excited, or maybe it is just a uh, tiered off bond, like dangling bond creates defect? Say that again. Okay. Uh, it will be your question two months later. Okay. How dangling bonds uh, ref are reflected in the uh, absorption spectra? If I remember correctly, we can convert electron volts to, like, say, nanometers or set centimeters inverse, like for C and UV vis or infrared. Yes. Yes. So, what would that be classified as? So you, you want uh, London to practice arithmetic and uh, convert <laughs> 0.5 electron volts into nanometers? Um, off the top of my head, I guess I don't really know. That would be infrared, I want. Well, 0.5, that would probably be like the lower end of this one, maybe? Infrared? You, you know the answer. Sort of. I Just want, roughly. I want to say it's in the ultraviolet range. But I might be. Well, oh, no, it's small electron volt, so I'd be in the infrared. And the question is simple: one electron volt, if if you keep not all sig figs, one thousand two hundred something nanometers, and it is one over. So one electron volt is one thousand two hundred. Okay. Two electron volts is about six hundred. Yeah. Point five electron volts will be like uh, how many thousand? How many hundred? Four hundred. Yes. <laughs> so that would definitely be infrared. <laughs> Good. Um, you have. I have one more question. Uh, you have mentioned 
energy pool profile, mm -hmm. and you, you've told that it runs over all orbitals from the first to the last. Mm -hmm. Is it mandatory, or can we uh, compute spectra skipping part of the orbitals and looking on the uh, smaller range of orbitals? You should be able to do that. Yeah. Uh, what should be changed in your uh, procedure? <clears throat> You're talking about this file? Yes. Okay. So then you would just change um, whatever range of orbitals that you're trying to consider. This would be your beginning orbital, and this would be the final orbital that you're actually trying to look at. So you can truncate energy pop, start it not from the beginning, and end it before the ending. But the input overlap and energy pop should be consistent. More questions? If not, then thank Landon once again. And we have two more presentations. Daniel Ramirez is invited to the stage, and uh, the last but not least two presentations um, leading us from characterization of static models to a protocol that would allow us to model reactions, or even if your uh, your interest is with very stable model, one can model it at the ambient temperature because nothing is frozen and properties of frozen material and uh, material at room temperature can be different therefore we need to ask daniel to teach us how to heat any model heat any model uh, yes i was tasked i was uh, tasked with how to, uh, how to model uh, atoms at uh, realistic temperatures and I guess in a sense, I'm unrealistic if you really want to set those parameters up. But um, the first step, I guess, uh, after you already have all these central uh, files, is to grab, make sure you grab the right NCAR file unless you know how to type it all out for you. But this will save you a lot of time in the end. So just make sure you grab the one that says heat. Um, and the first thing we look at in the, in the NCAR, since it's basically the input of what you're trying to tell it to do, is uh, we see you know these parameters right here. Uh, looking at it, we see the type of things I like to call uh, temperature beginning, temperature ending, and um, in this case, the number of cycles is uh, really, really important. You don't want to uh, take it lightly. You're gonna, it's gonna take you some computational time to uh, calculate these results, but in the end, that's what matters because uh, whatever you calculate, <clears throat> whatever your results are from here. You'll be using these for uh, molecular dynamics that uh, Russell will uh, talk to, will talk about after me. So uh, he can talk about all that stuff. Um, so the first thing is uh, one of the things you can do is thermal annealing, such as a, uh, you know, in the wet lab, you heat up the molecules, you bring it back down, you do repeat, rinse and repeat, you keep doing that over and over again. You can set that up however you want. So say you heat it up. Room temperature just change that around, and that's one parameter that, that uh that's really really important that we will just uh briefly touch. And the other one is a uh, kinetic energy scaling. This uh is how many time how many ionic steps is going to take before you uh as Dimitri likes to put it kick a molecule, and um, by kick it. I think it means when you introduce a uh, temperature to that, like you shock it with whatever uh, parameter you included it right there. So in this case, I, I ran my simulation with four ionic steps. I'll show you what that looked like. So first temperature we had was a uh, 300 Kelvin. Oh yeah, these weren't exactly the, the temperatures I used for parameters, but uh, that was my bad on that place. Um, but so for the first one, that was at 300. And it cooled down, cooled down, cooled down. Then the fourth step kicked back up to 300. And um, after that, it started to drop due to uh, some uh, fancy math that we all like. But I'll show that in a little bit. And then around there, it went up a little bit. Then it went back up a little bit more. But uh, I'll show you what a plot of this looks like eventually. If you also would like to watch it, science happen in front of you, you can watch it. But uh, you don't need to do that. Another way is if you have multiple jobs, you're running up at the same time, you don't want to work with the data till later. You just 
grab T on the Ozakar and it'll show up all of those uh these uh same values. But um, when it comes to plotting the data, which is pretty much the most important thing in any type of a uh, field of science, we notice we get something like this. So what this is trying to do is find equilibrium eventually, just like anything else, it wants to be at equilibrium. So I didn't include x or y axis. I didn't realize how to do that off the genuine plot, but you do that off of that, you then put this command where you plot TT. So uh, what this graph is trying to tell us to do is um, in any type of classical mechanics, uh, a chemical uh, potential energy cannot be more than its total energy. So what it does is at these temperature ranges, the temperature, uh, it, the temperature gets decreased due to the fact that it's being, um, the energy is being converted to potential energy. In a sense, I think that's what it basically means. But uh, it's basically uh, what we call a turning point. That's just what a definition of a turning point is. And that's, this is a nice math that comes along to it. So whenever, um, we talk about Gaussian. Gaussian usually convert, usually calculates all this stuff in zero Kelvin. So we all know that's not ideal conditions. We don't really see those type of conditions um, in the real world. But nonetheless, um, we adapt to it using this graph. And um, yeah, that's what these uh, temperature drops are. They're when we kick it. It drops and it's then converted to potential energy. You know, I think I uh, have any questions. Hopefully. Okay, but then Daniel. So all of this was done in Kelvin, just to make sure. Yeah. Okay. You know, how how stable does it have to be before you can say you're done heating? How stable? Oh, yeah, that's something I forgot to mention. Well, normally I did it. I did. Actually, um, do it like how it's supposed to do. You should have had included a good number of cycles. Uh, basically, I included mine to like 10 cycles, so it's not enough. You really want more about like 50 or so more. Uh, when it comes to these, you want more than about 10 kicks if you want to do the most minimal for anything. The, this, I think, only had like, well, I had four, I put it for 10 cycles. At a at a kick every at a kick every four cycles, so really it was only two kicks I included in this. So you want to make sure you have more than that. But we come. You wanted to say that you need to come um, continue kicking until the energy stops changing. So how how small deviations do you say? You set up your tolerance limit yourself. More questions to Daniel? If no, well, thank you once again. And uh, the time for the last but not least question. So uh, Russell Kaufman will um, present a skill that is naturally continuing presentation by Daniel, molecular dynamics. It is a critically important skill to model uh, chemical reactions, especially if you are not sure about uh, a reaction path and uh, which products will develop. And also there will be uh, um, another critically important skill of converting the computer molecular dynamics into form of movies that you can insert into your PowerPoint or upload to YouTube or to the journal Supplemental Information. For yours. Okay. Hello, everyone. I'm doing molecular dynamics and movies. So the first thing to know about molecular dynamics, and this is also true for heating, is we are including in our calculation uh, a delay algorithm 
Uh, so that's based on this equation here, which you probably recognize from your first semester of health-based physics, uh, which gives you position with uh, respect to initial position, uh, initial velocity, and acceleration. Uh, there are a lot of different formalisms for the delay equation, um, which is going to affect how they're represented algorithmically. Uh, and I don't know which one is actually used by VASP or what its particular method is. Uh, but from this equation, um, we can tell that we're going to need initial positions and uh, initial velocities, which are in the form of momentum, um, which we can either assign on our own for some experiment that we're thinking of, or produce that from a previous unit experiment. Um, in addition, we will also need a value for a time step, uh, as well as how many times we want to repeat this on. So the necessary files for molecular dynamics calculation is going to be the same as all the other calculations. Um, if you're uh, moving on from the heating experiment, you're going to want to copy your pot car K points and comp car from that directory to a new directory, and then rename your comp car uh, uh, to, uh, sorry, to post car. Um, and this will ensure that you have uh, initial momentum to play around with. Okay, so our in car file for um, molecular dynamics is very similar to the one we use for heating. Um, however, you'll notice that there is an absence of an end blocks uh, option, which means there won't be any kicking. So if you start with no initial momentum, you're never going to add momentum. Which is why it's important to do a heating experiment or assign them artificially. Um, options that you will need are IBRION equals zero. And this indicates that you will be using the delay equation and doing a molecular dynamics operation. Um, other op parameters you need to uh, make sure you set are T beginning and TN. They should match your heating uh, conditions. Or they should be whichever uh, temperature you're thinking of for your hypothetical experiment that you added an artificial uh, momentum to your uh, system. And then the other options we're going to need to set are hot time or hot tip, which uh, assigns the time step or our delta t for this experiment uh, in femtoseconds, and that should be one or smaller. The smaller it is, the better. Uh, going to be. And the same thing, or similarly with number of steps, the more steps we have, uh, the better that's going to be as well. Uh, so we submit this job just like any other fast job. If you're on the USD, you use the run fast script followed by the number of uh, cores you plan on using. And then it's probably a good idea to at least for a little while um, after your job has been running to watch its output. Uh, if you do watch to stat, uh, pipe rep, and then your job ID that you got from submitting the job uh, in the OSCAR file. And then you can watch your uh, calculation progress through its cycles. And on the left hand side here, the number before T is the step that you're currently on. So uh, out of your total NSW values you set in the in-car, uh, this will show where you're currently at. Um, so after our calculation has completed, we're going to have a lot of information in our OSICAR, which is going to look uh, very similar to how it did with the heating calculation. Uh, however, to make it a little bit cleaner, uh, you may want to rep uh, T equals from the OSICAR into a new file so that you can uh, look at just um, the information on that first line, uh, which uh, will give you step in the first column, temperatures, uh, total free energy, another total free energy, potential energy, and kinetic energy. Um, the reason why you might want this is if you plot any of these values against uh, the number of steps or time, it's going to uh, show you what is happening in your system as it progresses through however many femtoseconds the total molecular dynamics calculation takes. Uh, 
Uh, this can help you find energy, bar uh, energy barriers uh, that might happen as well as um, collisions that are occurring um, in your molecular dynamics simulation. Um, so if we want to visualize our um, our molecular dynamics uh, calculation, uh, we're going to want to use uh, one of several softwares to produce movies for it. Um, we should probably use VMD. Um, so Visual Molecular Dynamics um, is a free software uh, for the use. And one of the major draws of it is it can import um, the output and input files from uh, maps, which I don't believe any of the other common um, software is can do. Uh, so if you're going to make videos with uh, VMD, you're going to need VMD and VideoMock. Uh, both can be downloaded for free for personal use. Uh, and then uh, if you create XYZ files, which you can do on the USB using the script, as long as you're in a directory that uh, contains an x.car x file, um, you can create a .xyz uh, file which includes uh, the positions for each one of your time steps as well as the force and uh, free energy on the utility line at that point. And then you can visualize that in just about a second. Okay, so in BMD, importing our software, once you've installed BMD, uh, go to File, New Molecule, and then browse for the molecule you're looking for. Um, in this case, you're going to want to import the x.car um, output file, and it needs to be in the same directory as the concar file, or it won't load. Um, you can substitute concar files with postcar files, and that helps you. And then you always have to um, tell that you're opening an x.car file. For some reason, it can't automatically detect that. However, it will find your concar file. Um, once you've imported it, uh, it always defaults to representing whatever you've imported as lines. So for atoms, this is going to give you single points, which are hard to visualize. So uh, to change like the graphics representations and change the drawing methods. Uh, for single atoms, I like Eads, uh, Van der Waal, or CPK. Uh, and you can also use dynamic bonds for Okay, sorry, this is kind of a mess. It's trying to figure it out. Um, so uh, we can then generate movies from what, whatever we import into VMD uh, through extensions, visualization, and a movie maker. Um, and then it will open a new window, which gives us settings for the movie you want to make, uh, what kind of rendering style you want to use. So far, I've only used uh, screen capture because that's the quickest method. Uh, and then we can select what kind of movie you want to make. Um, for this, I want to do trajectory because I want to see how uh, this molecule changes over the course of uh, the 300 steps that I ran. Uh, you can also have it uh, do, uh, show what happened during the molecular dynamics while it rocks back and forth. Or if you have a stationary molecule, you can do rotation, rock and roll, or whatever. Um, and then once you've set that, I would probably change the working directory. It defaults to your C drive. I don't like reading or writing and then deleting lots of files in my C drive. So I'd probably set a temporary file folder for me to do that. Um, and then when you click Make Movie, a new window is going to pop up. Uh, so even if you've installed the new Mox the default um, uh, directory, it won't know where it is. So you'll have to find your video mock which by default is in program file slash VMOC, which is VMOC labs. Uh, and then uh, it will open video mock with uh, one frame for every one of your steps that you did in your molecular dynamics calculation. And you can change the video settings if you want. Uh, for example, this was 300 steps, so default is 30 frames per second, which is 10 seconds for a 300 tenth of second like a dynamic simulation, which means over the course of 10 seconds, this molecule barely moves. So you may want to increase the frames per second uh, that you're going to have in your final plan. 
Uh, it has a whole bunch of different video formats used to ever uh, you can make use of. And then once you hit start, it uploads your file. Uh, so um, making videos, this is an essential skill of the course. Uh, in this case, I'm using the perovskite uh, molecule that we were using uh, in the lab for 300 steps at just above room temperature. Uh, so this is 300 femtoseconds of uh, molecular dynamics. Uh, it's a highly crystalline material, so obviously it's very sticky. Convincing. Um, so when you're setting up your EMD experiments, or sorry, your VASP experiments, and you don't know what your various uh, options say or mean. In the case of IVRON, which equals zero, equals uh, means that you're going to do a molecular dynamics calculation with uh, the relay algorithm. You set that to different values, and you don't know what that means. You can look it up. Um, uh, in addition, you can add other options to your um, like the dynamics calculation, I mean, whatever you need to accurately um, represent the molecule. Any questions? Okay, but then, Russell? <laughs> questions? So, you do show uh, um, at room temperature, there are some uh, motions that are more vibrations rather than reactions. And you did identify that they are going relatively slow. How does it relate to the mass of this uh, involved ions? Oh, yeah, all of these are very large. Um, so it, it makes about one oscillation in 300 femtoseconds. What would you expect if it would be hydrocarbons? How many oscillations, like, uh, intuitively you would expect? Like for CH bond? They probably have close to a quarter of the mass. So a CH bond? Yes. Uh, if it would be like it's benzen, hydrogen, hydrogen. it's probably going to be uh, as many oscillations as hydrogen is lighter than uh, this one. What, what's the period of oscillations or frequency of CH bond? Uh, Me too. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's, uh, it's about maybe a couple of dozen femtoseconds. So uh, if it is, it will at oscillate at least 10 times if it is lighter, lighter molecule. So what you show is so boring because they are really heavy. More questions about protocol? It means everything is clear and everyone is uh, ready to repeat the same steps for the homework. <laughs> okay, but thank Russell once again. So, uh, many thanks for to all uh, presenters. You have completed uh, critically important uh, vital skills uh, for the practical use of, of BASP. Um, if you are still here in class, you have presented three times and submitted homeworks, you are on the right track to the best possible grade. <laughs> so, uh, just uh, how many four weeks are left and more major focus will be on real materials characterization the uh, there will be lectures but they will be some kind of most challenging task is to choose which molecule you want to investigate uh come when we meet next time i will try to show the options but everyone is welcome to select his or her favorite molecule or, or material and there is a homework that um, ch checks how well you are listening to each other. Um, thank you once again. Have a nice uh, weekend and see you next uh, Tuesday. It is this